Hi, good afternoon. This is Mike Morris. I'm the superintendent of schools here in Amherst and Pelham. And I want to thank everyone for coming on to our live stream uh, and appreciate your interest in our district. And we're really excited to meet you and your children. We were sad not to be able to do that this spring, uh, but we're looking forward in the fall to being able to do that in person. And so uh, the way we're going to uh, organize ourselves today is I'll do just a quick overview and you'll get to hear from all, all the principals of the four elementary schools, Crocker Farm, Fort River, Pelham, and Wildwood. Uh, we'll show you a virtual tour that we've made for all four schools. We'll show you an example of that and give you the link. Uh, and then we really want to spend most of the time with question and answers. I know with particularly given what's going on, there may be many questions for us and we want to spend most of our time in that question and answer place with you all, but we appreciate your time. We appreciate you coming in on a beautiful afternoon and spending some time with us in a virtual setting. And we're really excited that you're joining our districts. It, they're wonderful places for children. And um, you know, I think you'll hear lots of uh, that from our principals. Um, at about 4.30ish, we'll break off. And for people who are interested in finding out more about Cominantes and that program, uh, you're welcome to stay on for that as well. Uh, but again, at this point, I'm going to start with Derek Shea, who's the principal at Crocker Farm, and he's going to share with you just a little bit about Crocker Farm, um, and uh, and then we'll go through the schools, um, see the tour, and open it up. But uh, here's Derek. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Derek Shea. I am the uh, principal at Crocker Farm. Um, let me see. I've got a couple of minutes here. Mike said so. Uh, Good news, I guess. Maybe this is good news. So I am currently going to go into my 24th year here working in the Amherst schools. Uh, I've gone my 11th year at Crocker Farm. Uh, lived in town here for about 25 years. My, my wife and I, we have uh, two children, 17-year-old who's going to be a senior in high school, a 19-year-old who's just finished uh, his first year at university. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit quickly about Crocker Farm, So, because it's obviously a minute and a half here, and we'll talk soon. Uh, I love Crocker Farm. I love being at Crocker Farm. I think it's a fabulous place because we have a very uh, passionate and energetic uh, team of teachers. Uh, I'm a fairly energetic, sort of passionate person. So something that we all share uh, in the ranks in the school. Uh, and, and we're a school, I think we have a, a very a nice school, lots of nice picture windows. Um, we're a school, I think, with about around 340 or so students each year. Uh, we're a school who want to get better and want to improve every single year. So again, we have a committed group of, of teachers in, in a very sort of um, distributive leadership model where, where there's a lot of responsibility for our teachers to help shape the, the, the future of, of, of Crocker Farm. Um, so just a brief introduction. Uh, thank you for coming today. Thank you very much, Derek. Um, and going in alphabetical order, uh, we would then go to Fort River. Um, and so I'm gonna introduce uh, Diane Chamberlain, who is the principal there. So. Hi, Diane. Thanks for being Hi. here. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the district. If you're a new family to the district, welcome to returning families. Happy to be here with you. Uh, it's funny when we talk about introducing our schools, we also we often feel very repetitive because our, while our schools have individual identities, we have a lot of the same core values. So I just wanted to share with you the four goals of our school improvement plan. They are dual language education. They are family and community engagement improving our instructional practices and continuing the social emotional development of our students. And we house that kind of under uh, one common theme about choosing love when you walk into Fort River School. We try to make it as peaceful and safe a community for kids to be able to be their best learners. And I concur with Derek that Amherst in general has very committed educators um, and committed leadership to improving our practices and being self-reflective. And also um, in a nod to current events, uh, continuing to examine our own practices and biases and implicit and explicit biases and making sure we're trying to provide uh, an education that is socially just um, to better the improvement of our community and the larger world. That's just a quick tidbit about Fort River. Thank you, Diane. Uh, next, we'll go over to Pelham. And Pelham, we actually have two people who are going to speak. So one is Lisa Desjardins, who's done a wonderful job in her 10 years at Pelham and is departing. Uh, and we're going to bring in Lee, who will be the principal, and they're already connecting a lot to make that transition smooth. So I'll get Lisa up and Lee. Good afternoon and welcome and, and coming to join us. Uh, my name is Lisa Desjardins. I am the outgoing principal, and we have Lee here, who is the incoming principal. So Lee and I have been working in collaboration. Um, we've only just begun the journey to 
uh, help her to transition and acclimate to the Pelham School community. I'll speak a little bit about um, my perspective as being part of the Pelham community for 10 years. Uh, Pelham School is a welcoming, inclusive environment, and our staff members and communities feel very strongly in having a school culture and program in which students are supported and they get what they need. The school is, is a, it's smaller than the other elementary schools. There's only one class per grade level. Uh, and and um, it really creates a, a family type of, of environment so that everyone gets to know each other. And it, it feels um, like it's a very close knit community. We have a very supportive PTO and my staff are, as are all the other teachers in the districts, um, very dedicated and hardworking, focused on improving their practice, including uh, looking at providing equitable practices and really getting better at looking at um, areas in the curriculum to strengthen and promote student engagement and uh, incorporate technology. So, you know, we are um, always happy to have uh, newcomers come in. About half the school is school choice. We draw in uh, students from around 14 other surrounding communities, which provides for a much more diverse environment. So um, that's what I'll say about Pelham School, and I'll turn it over to Lee. Sure, so I'll just share a little bit about myself. So welcome everyone. And for those of you who are new to the district or new to Pelham Elementary School, we are in it together. So I am new to the district also, and I'm new to the role of principal. So I've been the assistant principal at Blanchard Memorial School in Acton Boxborough for the past two years. And prior to that, I was a first grade teacher. And before that, I was a fifth grade teacher. So all of those experiences really shape how I approach leadership. And because I come from an early childhood background, kindergarten is super important to me and in the way I support instructional practices in the school. So how that shows up is really emphasizing early literacy support and lots of joy in learning and collaborative opportunities for children to come together, build relationships, explore the world, and build all of the foundational skills that they'll carry with them through the rest of their lives. So I love kindergarten. I'm so excited to meet you and meet your children. Um, I know it's a really challenging time right now to be thinking about sending your children to school and you must have so many questions. So what I can tell you is we will figure it out together and we are in it together. So Lisa and I are working collaboratively with the staff to make the transition as smooth as possible. Um, and I'm really looking forward to working with you. Thank you so much, Lee and Lisa. Um, and last but not least, we'll have um, Nick Yaffe, who's the principal at Wildwood School, talk a little bit about Wildwood. It's hard to go last, Nick, I think, because we do have a lot of similarities between our school populations. But, uh, you know, I think there are unique qualities, and I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts about Wildwood. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, so I'll start with that, because Diana also said that. Is So everything I'm about to say, I would say, is true for all the other schools, as well as what they said is true for Wildwood, but we each have our own unique qualities and we all love our school. So starting there that I think from the principals, assistant principals to all the staff is this great passion for our school communities. And I wish I could see you and welcome you all. And if there are any students out there who are listening, I usually say when I welcome students, typically students are thinking of two things. One, is my teacher going to be nice? Two, will I make friends? And at Wildwood and all the schools, we have teachers who care deeply about creating relationships that connect to each student and that we get to know each student, who you are, and we strive to have our schools be places where you can be who you are and where our students themselves will reach out to you and try to include you and try to make friends with you because we want our students to be active active participants in life, active citizens in the world, and understand how to make the world a better place. So to be leaders, what we call leaders of their own learning. 
And the second thing I'll say that's true for all the schools is we believe that there are many different kinds of intelligences and we help to integrate the arts, integrate different ways of expressing what you know at our schools. So we look forward to seeing you in person and I'll, I'll end it with that. Thank you so much. And, and something that I always talk about with kindergarten families is, you know, we think about uh, it's 2020 now, these is, uh, students are gonna graduate about 2033. And, and so who knows what the world will look like by then, but they're gonna show us the way. Uh, and we're just so excited to get to meet them, graduate high school, I should say. I think just one anecdote I wanna share before I show the tour is just, um, that shows a lot about our schools is a couple of years ago, like in many communities, there was an interest in starting a garden program uh, in our schools. And the teachers who primarily jumped at the chance to be involved were our kindergarten teachers. Um, this is before we really had a set curriculum. It was something we wanted to try. And they, they jumped at the chance because they thought, what a wonderful way to promote authentic learning in our schools. And what you'll know now is that kindergarten through third grade, we've expanded all the way up through third. Uh, we have beautiful gardens next to all of our schools. And it's not just gardens for garden's sake, although I think there's a lot of value and virtue to that. It's garden as integrated as part of the curriculum that we don't have kindergarten students doing worksheets all day, and some people that's their kindergarten experience. We have kindergarten students actively engaged and involved in the learning um, that they're they're doing. And, and I think the garden is just so tan it's a tangible reflection of the way we approach that whole child approach. Uh, that's so important to us. Students have the aesthetics, so they have uh, physical education and art and music. They learn some technology skills. Uh, and as they get older, they have more and more opportunities. Um, so I think many families, when they're concerned about sending their child to pre from kind of preschool to kindergarten is that they'll lose the opportunity for outdoor play, for experiential learning, and for really a whole child approach. And uh, that's certainly consistent with our values in Amherst that we hold on to that. Uh, we certainly care an awful lot about academics and we can answer questions about that. We also want to reflect that these students are five years old and we want to understand developmentally uh, what it means. We want them to love learning and love school. And, and that's a major focus across all of our schools. So because we can't be in the school, I'm going to share uh, a link. I'll do it in the chat feature. Um, let's see. Um, and I'll try to share my screen so people can uh, get a look. We'll, we'll pick on Wildwood as a uh, our school to show, but I wanna do a little tutorial. So all of our schools have um, three dimensional uh, or 180 degree pictures um, throughout the school because we know for many students and families uh, having access to these kind of things when we can't tangibly be, be there, we typically would in the spring would be helpful. Additionally, there's narration. So if you click on the gearbox on any of our tours and click on turn narration on, in this case, you'll hear Nick. Pull up the wild wood, one of the first things that you notice is the rainbow doors from afar. Rainbow doors seem to say to all children, families, and staff, come in. This is a place of joy. This is a colorful place. It's a place where you'll get to express yourself and be who you are. And not every picture has narration, but uh, if you go on, is a oops, welcoming community. turn that off, apologize. Yep. Um, you can, and you can literally see a walk through the rooms um, and through different spaces in the school as well as the narration. And one of the reasons we really wanted these, um, these tours to be there is we thought it was so important for families, but particularly for young children to get a visual of, of what they're in. You'll see kindergarten classrooms in each of the tours because we wanted to really uh, have a way that young children could understand and, and take a look and see what their classrooms might look like. Um, so we wanted to share that with, with all of you. We hope it's a resource that you can use with your children uh, to help with that uh, understanding of where they're going um, and be a resource. I want to thank all the principals who did that narration and our information systems teams who put that together. Uh, we started thinking about, you know, walking around the school with an iPhone or an iPad, but we, we thought the interactive piece and the tactile piece of moving for five-year-olds was much more developmentally appropriate uh, and be a lot more fun, frankly, uh, for a five-year-old. So Nick, thank you for letting me use the Wildwood one as an example, but all four of our schools are there. Um, at this point, we'd like to, uh, we talked for about 15 minutes, which was our goal, uh, keep it to about 15. Uh, for anyone on the live stream, for all 37 of you, thank you for joining. Um, Two more things. One is that we'd love to answer your questions. So uh, if you are there um, on the kind of lower right side where it says, I think the blank says, say something. If you type in a question or a comment in that, uh, we'll be able to bring it up so everybody can see it. 
uh, and, and principals can weigh in and, and, and jump in. Also, I know that there were families who weren't able to join us today. This YouTube link that you're on will stay, um, will stay active forever. Um, so if someone else is, oh, I missed it, I wanna hear what people said, uh, you'll have that opportunity. Um, but uh, I'll give it a second, maybe uh, since there aren't questions coming in, some typical ones we get are, um, you know, a lot of times students are anxious about coming to kindergarten and uh, making new friends. Um, Nick talked about that a little bit earlier. And so I wonder if some of our principals might have some helpful advice of um, how to talk to young children about uh, those kind of natural fears that they may not be in the same school or the same class with their uh, preschool friends and um, how parents can reassure, parents guardians can reassure them. Let's see if anyone's willing to jump in on that one. Um, I'm going to pick on Diane, who I think you <laughs> wanted to jump in on that one. Thank you, Diane. Sure. So um, we expect nerves from young ones, and we expect the uh, change to be something significant, right? They are coming from an environment they may be very comfortable with, either in the home or in the preschool. But we have experienced teachers that know how to ease those, those transitional woes for students. Um, we develop routines and teach those routines directly. We teach the expectations, expectations of the school, each one of us with care and with love, knowing that they're five years old and we're gonna need a little while to get those routines ingrained in them so they can be their best selves. Our emphasis at the beginning is really making those social connections. Um, I know that all of the elementary principals feel really strongly that making sure the children feel safe before we start thinking about a lot of curriculum is really important. Um, so your job as, fa as families is just to get them good sleep, get them uh, as, as prepared as you can with just pep talks that it's all going to be fine. Um, talk to them about the school bus if they're going to ride the school bus. Um, talk to them about just listening to their teacher and being open to making new social connections. We take care of the rest when they're with us and the hours of school being open and we're gonna communicate with you as much as we possibly can about what things will look like. But your job is just to try to be as positive as possible. And if the students come home with any kind of situation that you're concerned about, just making sure you're communicating with the teachers. The teachers are, are very adept at um, making school feel like home in short order. So again, routines are really important. Confidence and partnering with, this, with the school is really kind of vital. Hopefully I've hit everything that's necessary. The job is ours. You just need to help be in communication with us, really. So uh, staying with that theme, there's a couple of questions that came in and I'll display them. So one question is, what can parents do throughout the summer to best prepare our, our kids for school? Um, Diane, I know you touched on some things, but I wonder if someone else has, has more information to add. Um, that's another common one that certainly comes up. Let's see, who wants to jump in? Um, well, I'll start and then uh, I'll look for someone else to jump in as well. But uh, I think for me, and you know, and many of us, um, McCall went through this at some point in the past, uh, some of us pretty recently, speaking for myself. Um, and so I think the big thing, and I'm going to pick up where Diane, uh, piggyback on Diane's comment, is just making sure students, you know, your children feel confident um, and excited for school. Um, you know, I think uh, the thing that kind of, if the question is a little more academically focused or if some folks are thinking about that, um, reading books, which you're, uh, I know many of you are already doing, just continuing to foster that love of reading. Uh, your job is not to teach your children to read. That, that's the school's job. But fostering a love of reading really makes that teaching students to read um, or, or read more so much easier. So I think that's one. Playing with numbers, um, and this isn't about doing worksheets, but just playing with numbers, you know, card games, um, different ways that students can be interacting, I think, creatively. Um, I also think um, dramatic and imaginative play with your kids is one of the nicest things you can do. And I think it's a nice transition from preschool where that is uh, more readily uh, part of the curriculum. Uh, and it's certainly there in, in kindergarten. But, uh, you know, I think maintaining that youthfulness um, and that curiosity is really critical. Um, if we're able to, I'm getting uh, chats from some of the people on the line uh, on our uh, our principals. You know, if, if we are able to allow students to go and see the school and check out the neighborhood, that'd be uh, a really nice thing as well. And, and you know, with the current situation, we'll have to see what the guidance is. Um, but we'll certainly be communicating throughout uh, about that guidance. Let's see if there's anything else people want to. Hopefully, I captured that one. Um, 
Will children be able to meet their teacher before the school year starts? So typically that would happen in, um, in the spring. Um, and with the uncertainty of exactly how fall will look, and there's a couple of questions about that, so I'll probably address that more generally. Um, we'd like to see how we can do that. It may have to be in a virtual format. Um, you know, uh, it may, hopefully not, um, but we're, we're not quite sure. We're waiting for some state guidance exactly uh, what the beginning of the school year will look like. Um, but, you know, our goal would be to certainly have connections made. Uh, and, you know, typically the way kindergarten starts, and I'll, I'll actually turn over to Nick, um, who can talk a little bit about typical years kindergarten orientation. And I have no intern, I have no inkling that this wouldn't happen this year. Um, but kindergarten starts in a very different way than grades one through 12. And so I'll turn it over to Nick. Uh, who can speak to this more directly. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so we do have a structure in place and, and just the preface to, I, I taught kindergarten for 20 years and, and in the district. So also like Lee was saying, that's my heart. And I think all of us love going in the kindergarten, but so what the district has is, is uh, which I would imagine whatever form school takes will continue is this visiting in small groups. And so that happens you know, during the beginning of the school. So the other children go to school for the first th three days and then kindergartens come in, in in a small group to meet the teacher. Typically they show them the classroom and the different areas. And um, that way it's, it's a bit of an orientation and a soft start to school. And then beyond that, at the in the first few days of the first month of school, really so much is just helping kids connect to the routines, as Diane was talking about, of making friends and connecting to each other. Thank you, Nick, appreciate it. Um, so next question is just wondering what you know so far about how school will work in the fall due to COVID. Uh, so actually there's a school committee meeting tomorrow night. If you live in Amherst uh, and you have kind of TV, then it's on channel 15. It also is a live stream link if you wanna watch it that way. And I'll be presenting some information uh, about some options. It won't be making a recommendation. DESE, uh, which is our state governing board, uh, told me this morning that they're going to make um, some share their explicit thoughts on it probably two or three weeks from now. But at least if you want to get a flavor of the discussion, you know, I'll be making a rather lengthy, I apologize, much longer than today, uh, presentation tomorrow night, you know, probably starts 6.45 or 7. The meeting starts at 6.30, but um, I think it's, it, there's a couple of other things that have to happen beforehand. Um, so, you know, what we know right now is what we have CDC guidance, the Center for Disease Control has put out guidance um, that certainly would impact uh, things like the number of students who could be in a classroom at any given time and some of the structures of school. Um, there's nothing in the CDC guidance based on what we're seeing in Massachusetts right now in terms of numbers that would suggest that school would not occur in the fall, you know, and we're hoping that doesn't change for both for school, but also, you know, for, for everyone in Massachusetts. Um, but in terms of models, there there will be have to be some kind of um, differences in terms of the models based on the guidance they received, but from from the CDC as well as what we're going to receive from DESE. Um, so I wish I had more clarity. Trust me, I really wish I had more clarity on that one right now. Um, but we're going to tomorrow is our first public presentation uh, of what we know, what we don't know, and what potential options there are for for um, for all students in our districts um, starting next year. So. Um, that's sort of where we are, you know, I think we'll have better direction again, DESE guidance coming out in um, about two weeks from now, uh, and we'll start that community conversation tomorrow night. I think worthwhile to know that we're also going to be surveying families and um, those of you who are registered, uh, which I assume is, is everyone on this call, and if not, you can get in touch with me afterwards, um, we'll receive those surveys and we want to gather the feedback from staff um, and caregivers so that we can uh, take all that into account in, in all of our decisions making that we're gonna plan to make uh, for the next school year. Um, seems like on that theme, which makes sense given the, the world we're living in uh, on June 2nd here, uh, the current situation with the opportunities for kids to meet one another since the be playground times. That's a really great question. Um, uh, you know, it makes me think of when we are sending out class lists or things like that in the summer, if there's some way to ask for permission, perhaps, from families to share information so that at least um, some distance play dates can happen. I know, you know, I've got a young kid and uh, we've been able to try to have some um, distance play dates. Um, it's a little hard if you don't know the other child. Um, and uh, but at least being in the same spaces, I think um, perhaps we can figure that out or perhaps virtually 
uh, connect folks. So uh, a lot of our parent guardian organizations order organize yearbooks or uh, excuse me, not yearbooks, directories um, each year. And I think particularly for kindergarten, uh, that's great feedback. We think about how to how to make, perhaps make some of those connections. And and by the way, Debbie, who who is our communication director, put in the chat. Uh, just uh, when the information, when the discussion is tomorrow night and how to access it. Um, I'm going to have Derek and then Lisa jump in with some thoughts on this as well. Hi, Derek. Uh, this is uh, Derek again. So the one thing that I think it may be worth also mentioning, so we've talked a little bit, I think, about uh, coming to school and you have your uh, kindergarten teacher. Um, ordinarily, and, and we'll see how things here, but, you know, but ordinarily you would also be in a classroom uh, each kindergarten class has has a teacher and also an assistant teacher, and and in Amherst, it's ordinarily a a, a, a teacher that's uh, qualified as a teacher, but has chosen to become a paraprofessional because perhaps in terms of it suits their family best. Um, but you you'll find that when you come to to Crocker Farm, Wildwood, Pelham, uh, Fort River, um, your child is going to get to know a large number of adults because we have many many people, thankfully, who, who work in our schools. Um, Counselors, uh, PE teachers, uh, music teacher, uh, or English language learner teachers, uh, lots of different teachers are going to become uh, our secretaries. Secretaries get very, very tight with the kindergarten group. So the beautiful part is, is that I think you know, your child's going to get tight with the teacher, but then there's also, and people like myself as the principal, we get to know the names of every single student in our school, and we get to know something about our students and their families. Um, so, so there's this massive group of people who are going to help. Um, sort of envelope people's lives and, and support you in, in, in any way we possibly can. So I'll just add on to what Derek said. Derek, I think Derek was thinking exactly what I was in terms of uh, for families to be aware of the supports that are in place for these young children that are coming into our schools. For many of them, they may not have had a, an earlier schooling experience. And so the teachers are prepared to meet and work with uh, a range of uh, students that have may or may not have had previous experiences. And so we have all, all hands are on deck to support our youngest students. And we want to make sure that they feel comfortable. And we know how challenging it is, challenging it is for families sometimes to leave um, their babies with us in a new environment and children are often crying and sometimes parents are leaving crying too. But we are there and, and we ensure that children are happy. Uh, we've even gone so far as sometimes to call parents afterwards and say, guess what? They stopped crying five minutes after you left. So we want to make sure that your child experiences a, a successful entry into the programs and that you feel confident and comfortable with leaving them in our hands. And we work really hard at establishing those relationships and building in those supports. Thank you, Lisa, I appreciate it. Um, just seeing if there's other questions that come through. I think uh, one thing that I just wanna share while we'll give people another couple minutes, um, see if they have any questions, is uh, I wonder if one of the principals can just go through what a typical daily schedule looks like for a kindergartner. Um, and how that evolves over the course of the year, because we, we know when, when they come in, uh, they're coming in from a preschool environment, and there's there's a really uh, gradual release of kind of a more structured schedule. Our elementary schools, to be clear, don't have bells. They don't go off, right? A lot of uh, first-time uh, parents to the district ask about that, and um, it's, it's a very flexible schedule. I wonder if, um, Nick, could I uh, ask volunteer you to speak a little bit about kindergarten schedule? Oh, hey. Hi, everybody. Sure, I'd be happy to. So, again, we, we at our schools, we like to think of the, particularly, we call it the first six weeks, the first month or more, as a time to just help children become oriented, to make connections to the teachers, to each other, and understand the, the routines of the classroom and, and of the entire school. So that's the, the real primary focus. I mean, typically, we believe in active uh, in the in the school setting is a welcoming time, and so that the kindergarten teachers do this wonderful job of just welcoming students, um, whether they're coming off the bus or, or parents have driven them, and guiding them into the into the classroom. And what's wonderful about kindergarten is seeing that sense of empowerment as they settle into being full members of the school community. 
And so after a welcoming time and the choices that are uh, typically there at centers, um, they gather together for a morning meeting uh, that also introduces things like calendars or ways to greet each other and songs. And then after that, there would be literacy centers and kids are, are introduced to the foundation of, of literacy and learning and developing a love of, of books and writing and things like that. And then after that, this is the very important snack time where kids have time to socialize and eat. And we are committed to taking kids outside and experiencing beautiful nature that's uh, surrounding them, like Mike said at the farms, the farm to school program. And then in terms of coming in, there's a transition from outside time and, and, and we teach math through exploration. And all our kindergarten teachers have been trained in this approach in terms of thinking deeply about math, but through play and through games. And I would say that each of our schools is also a project-based approach to kindergarten, whether that's around themes that are connected to the real world and to literacy and, and math as well. Um, and I left out, of course, lunch, which is super important. It's, and every kindergarten classroom goes to specials uh, uh, each day. And so we have art, music, PE, library, and technology. Um, Thank you, Nick. I appreciate it. Um, one that we're, we're hearing a lot, or, or at least uh, people have a lot of different thoughts on this one. So I'll just read it aloud. Barring a vaccine, we have very serious reservations about sending our kid to school this fall. Heartbreaking as that would be, can you speak to those concerns? I can, um, and I'll take that one uh, on. So uh, what I'd say, and you'll hear this if you tune in tomorrow night, is uh, consistently this district has taken more stringent measures than even have been recommended by the state uh, as it relates to safety um, in general, but particularly this spring. Uh, we closed school uh, for the, uh, given the pandemic uh, before DESE and before the state uh, suggested we do, we do that. We extended it further um, than once they did finally uh, slow us down. And we've been very, very cautious, um, quite honestly, ca more cautious than some people would prefer um, about um, people being in buildings. Um, there are districts, and I'm not here to criticize them, but there are districts that have been uh, made decisions about you know, having people back in buildings, even if it's just to get belongings. And, and we've been on the opposite end of that. And so what I can share with, with anyone uh, who's on the call is that if we do work on a plan to come back, it's going to be incredibly safe. We're going to follow our CDC guidance. Uh, we'll see what Desi says, but uh, we, we trust our public health guidance. And we'll take all the measures that we know um, are needed to be able to follow, uh, and we'll follow those stringently. Um, I think we have one of the advantages is that we have a grant. Uh, we received it for five years, but it started this, this year, thank goodness, and we have a nurse leader. Um, who is uh, in her own community, one of the head nurses who's on the front lines of this. And she also uh, works with us, uh, works with the nurses, but also has access to uh, incredible public health information. And that's guiding us every step of the way. So um, I certainly can't make decisions for families. And I completely understand being a parent of young kids myself. I completely understand that concern. Uh, and all I can share is that we will not make, uh, will not take steps that uh, are against the guidance we receive from the public health experts. Uh, we, we don't just follow them, we're going beyond them uh, in how we're approaching this. And that may mean a slower rollout of, uh, of all the things that we like to think about at school, uh, but we don't take chances with public health. And what we're uh, feverishly working as we speak, frankly, on is what are models of school where we can have students in school and have safeguards and have it still feel as much as possible like school for young children. Um, so our team has been working uh, really um, in the last month, I would say, uh, in the last couple of weeks in particular, about what would that look like. Um, I'm not getting ahead of myself to say that, you know, if you look at the CDC guidance, it's going to mean there's fewer students in a classroom and uh, the distancing. And, and we're looking at our school buildings and how do we make sure that the ventilation systems and all those um, are at, at working at the highest level. And that may mean some summer where it will mean some summer work on our buildings. And uh, you know, during normal times, you know, these concerns weren't so acute, uh, but certainly in this period, we're taking incredibly seriously 
and we'll only open school if we feel like we can meet those stringent guidelines we receive from CDC and others in ways that we feel comfortable with. Um, and um, that's meant sometimes pushing back, frankly, on uh, what politicians and other folks have wanted us to do or asked us to do. But at the end of the day, uh, this particular district, we take it incredibly seriously. So I can't really answer your question. Um, or, or comment because uh, in every you know, you'll hear this throughout your whole experience as an Amherst and Pelham Public School family. Uh, we we can do what we can do um, and to to support you all. And as parents, your as parents caregivers, I should say, you're your child's first teacher, and uh, we really want to give you the tools so that you can make the best decisions um, that you think are in the best interest of your child. And and that's what we'll work on, and that's what we'll do. Uh, we'll have a lot more information again tomorrow evening. Uh, about some of those, I'll, I'll go in uh, probably um, more detail than, than it'll be. It'll be a long presentation about CDC guidelines uh, and how we're thinking about them and how we feel like we can meet them and what the potential implications are. So sorry for the long-winded uh, response, but I think it's a very real question on the minds of many families, and I wanted to be thorough in my response as much as I can be before I finish my presentation, probably uh, right before you know meetings at 6.55 or 6.30 tomorrow night. So uh, we're still working on it and still getting more guidance um, from public health folks, and um, we'll work on it from there. But one of the things that we've done this spring, and, and that's by the we, I mean the collective we, W.S. Moreland, it's our communication director, principals, uh, all of us have been incredibly thorough about communication throughout. Um, so that was one of the things. We did a survey of families. We're doing another one in a couple of weeks. Uh, and one of the things the question was asked, you're getting enough information uh, from, from leadership. And that was one of the strongest responses on the survey uh, in terms of people feeling like they had accurate information. The communication flow was, it was a two-way communication flow. And they knew what we were doing as we were doing it. When we closed school, they knew what the plan was as the plan evolved because our state shifted what we, they asked us to do. Uh, in terms of distance learning, we were able to communicate that thoroughly uh, about that. And if you go to our website and um, there's a COVID-19 page and it kind of details, especially on the early days, how many uh, communications were going home and what they were. It's, it's kind of oddly enough, a, a bit of an oral history uh, of the last two months, um, but certainly that's a public information and, and we're happy for you to take a look at it and, and share feedback with us. Uh, that's gonna be critically important too. Because uh, CDC is an external group, and we also want to know what families feel like they need to make themselves feel comfortable. Uh, it's always hard, you know, having done it twice in the last six years. Uh, dropping your kindergarten off is not the easiest thing without a pandemic. Um, and so, with the additional health risks and health concerns that are going on, we certainly understand and acknowledge that, and we want to make sure you feel comfortable and confident with our decisions, and that they're going to work as best as best as possible for you, given the situation. Other comments or questions before we transition to talking about commonantes? So I don't see any. Um, so uh, we're going to transition a second. We're going to, um, I'll give all the principals just a quick chance to say goodbye and uh, a goodbye message. But um, what's going to happen after they do that is Diane Chamberlain, who's the principal of Fort River, Katie Richardson, who's ELO and, and language coordinator, myself are going to stay on. We're going to talk a bit about Comenantes, which is our dual language Spanish-English program. And um, no one has to stay, certainly. But if you're interested in finding out more, uh, we'll do a brief presentation and, again, question and answers. But thank you all for being on. So I'll let Mr. Shea uh, say goodbye. Uh Thank you everyone for uh, coming today. I just, I'll say this quickly. So I mentioned earlier, um, I, I know it's difficult times. There's a lot going on in the world, a lot of complex stuff happening in the world. Um, but as a parent, again, of a 17 year old and 19 year old, um, I remember starting with my kids in kindergarten like it was yesterday, right? So in the blink of an eye, it goes so rapidly. I hope um, you're all enjoying the moment. Yeah. Um, time with your four or five year old. Um, hopefully we'll see you in the fall and um, be in touch if you need anything. I, I will certainly communicate with you, call back, email, whatever works. Take care. Thank you, Derek. Okay, and uh, I'll now go to Pelham. Um, sorry to catch the mid drink there, Lee. I skipped over Fort River because Anne's not going anywhere. So um, she's, uh, she's staying on the call. So sorry about that. Um, and lovely to see your cat behind you, Lisa. This is the, the way this is the way of the world these days. So uh, but Lisa and Lee, if you wanted to say anything before people uh, before you departed. 
Hello, I just want to say thank you as well for attending today. And, you know, it's unfortunate. I wish we could see you all um, because it's hard not having that face to face and um, uh, person connection. Um, but I, I can see you're there in the chat. And, and that's great that you were able to make time in your day to join us. I do want to say that um, I am up at the school. Uh, three days a week. And uh, aside from that, I'm accessible by email and by phone. Lee uh, will also be uh, around and available uh, for any questions. And I, I will be working with Lee to um, help her with uh, the transition for kindergarten and, and explain to her the whole process and what we do to ensure that things go seamlessly. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to call the school. The number is 362-1101. That's my direct line. And if you leave a message, I will be sure to get back to you. And I'll leave it for Lee to say something else, but goodbye. Great, thank you, Lisa. So um, I would just say to the Pelham families who are on today, uh, communication went out from me yesterday with some information about some virtual community forums in the next few weeks. So I'm hoping that you're able to join those. We can talk a little bit more about kindergarten or any questions that you have. Um, and again, I'll just reiterate how excited I am to be joining the district and the community at Pelham and to get to know you and your children. Thank you so much, Lee. Uh, take it easy and good luck with uh, your transition, your life transition coming up as well. We're happy to happy to have you on the team. So thank you, Lee. And Mr. Yaffe. Okay, everybody. Hi. Um, yeah, so I can't wait to meet you all in person and greet you and your children. And typically we have a of an event where we would also welcome you and whether we do that virtually or or not, so it would just be a more, a smaller event where we could see you and you could ask us questions. Please feel free to reach out to me at uh, yaffien at arps.org. And also you can get a flavor of Wildwood in any of the schools by checking out our websites and some of the online resources that we've created uh, during this time of distance learning. So once again, welcome, and I can't wait to see you and meet you in person. Thank you so much. Um, so at this point, we're going to transition to talking about Comenantes. Um, I'll do a, sort of a, a, a short spiel, spiel, excuse me, and then I'll turn it over to Diane and Katie. Um, actually, I'll get them on now. Um, so, uh, and they can share uh, some pieces. So this is the first year that we've had our Comenantes program. It's a dual language program. Um, we've been talking about it. There was multiple iterations. So I've been in the district, I should have said, this is my end of my 19th year in uh, the district. I started as elementary teacher at Fort River, actually, uh, fifth and sixth grade. And I was a principal at Crocker Farm, and then I was did some curriculum work at Central Office, but I've been here a while. And um, so this was sort of the third iteration of those 19 years when dual language programming um, was talked about and fortunately we were able to do it and, and it really has multiple goals and so there's certainly academic goals and Katie will go over some of the research uh, and Diane about that uh, but also the cultural goals are equally important and um, it's been a wonderful success for students this year and so uh, we are looking you know I think to the conversation earlier we're, we don't quite know what our model is going to be next year but we are committed to Comenantes. we found it to be an incredibly successful program for our students and our families and uh, we will be working in Caminantes to the model that school occurs in in the fall. Again, we don't exactly know the model, but it's the, the commitment is there regardless. Um, at this point, I'll turn it over to Katie and to Diane. And Katie, did you want me to pull up slides or do you want to speak to them? What would you prefer? Uh, sure, let's, let's go ahead and use that. Okay, I will set them up. Give me one minute. Introduce yourself, Katie, for that, because you haven't been on. Well, I'm getting them on. Hi, everyone. I'm Katie. And um, ELL and dual language coordinator. Um, happy to talk with you all tonight. Um, we're really excited that we're going to be going into our second year of the Caminantes program, um, and we look forward to wel welcoming a new class. So we're just going to share a little information um, that's kind of the general information and then answer any questions that come up for you. Um, I feel like I could talk a really long time about this because there's so many details and, you know, things that are exciting about it and, and seeing how it's grown even in the first year. 
Um, but you know, we'll we'll try to give you the short um, overview. So um, as as Dr. Mara stated, the goals really of a dual language program are always bilingualism, biliteracy, and cultural competence, and academic achievement. Right. So there's um, really maintaining that high level of achievement for all students, but doing it across two languages. Um, so that gives a really great opportunity for our students that could be English learners, that could be Spanish learners, or could be bilingual students. Um, so this is kind of the gist, right, is that this is a really unique program. It's an additive model where we're looking for um, building true bilingualism and biliteracy across the, the grade span. So we have uh, commitment from the district to continue adding a grade level each year and um, going through sixth grade and then hopefully long term we'll, we'll be looking at moving it up from there. Um, we know it does take a significant amount of time to develop that real bilingualism and biliteracy, um, but we know that the outcomes are awesome in terms of academic achievement and reading and um, the goal of really being in a global community and having the skills uh, to move forward in that way. So this is just a little bit about our mission, which dovetails really nicely with the school vision um, at Fort River, that we're working really hard to celebrate and integrate the cultures of all of our students um, and to build our students to their fullest potential. Um, Diane, feel free to jump in at any time. You're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> great. Um, so this is, again, the real short version of how it works. Um, children spend half their day working with one teacher and half their day working with the other teacher. Um, the, we really try to adhere to a 50-50 model so that we're getting the same amount of exposure to both languages um, and building capacity there. Um, let's see. Yep, so children will learn each subject in both languages. So our model for kindergarten this year was um, the literacy pieces, the um, reading and writing happens through an integrated either social studies or science unit. Um, and if you can follow the, it's hard to explain, it's easier to look at this piece, but we basically had um, Spanish taught science first, and then the next unit was a social studies unit. So the two languages were kind of switching back and forth in terms of the science and social studies so that the students are exposed to the language of both content areas. Um, and then of course, reading language arts is taught in both languages and math is worked across both languages as well. Um, let me see. And we have been providing transportation um, across the district for families who are coming from the other school zones. We'll see how that fits into all of the details as we move forward. but. Um, it is a Fort River based program with the possibility for students from other areas of the district to join. So here's just a couple questions um, as to, you know, what how you would think about, is this a good fit? So do you already speak Spanish or are you interested in, in having a bilingual, um, you know, schooling experience for your kids? And it, that, like I said, can go both ways. Um, it's about developing those cross, Po positive cross-cultural attitudes um, and things like, you know, you have to stretch a little because not all of our families who are working with students in this program are bilingual themselves. So you have to be ready to, to give that stretch and um, help support them in the ways you can, knowing that, you know, you may be just an English speaker or just a Spanish speaker. Um, so I think that's, let's say, yeah, homework in the second language. Not that we give much homework, especially in the early grades, really, we just want kids reading. Um, but so we provide tools to help with that. And Katie, I'll jump in here because I know we've just discovered this kind of got reiterated recently is that as English speaking families, um, we are now, if you're in this program, you're now put in the place of what all English learner families have experienced, that they don't have the fluency in the language to necessarily be able to help their child acquire that language. And that has to be a discomfort that you're able to sit in. And we're gonna to try to help you the best we can on how to bridge between English and Spanish, but it's the, the experience of the English language learner that um, you and your family will experience in a way that you haven't in previous, previously. Right, yeah, so it's a unique experience having <laughs> everybody is a language learner in this context. 
And we try to think of everyone at Fort River as a language learner. Yeah, even in English, we say, you know, academic language isn't anybody's first language. So we're always focused on that and how to make language accessible. And this is just an you know additional uh, piece of that. So there's a couple of links. We can share this um, presentation um, if folks want to be able to access the enrollment policy and uh, the family compact kind of gives what we're hoping families will agree to um, and have an awareness of when they do enroll their children in the dual language program. Um, so that gives a little more detail on kind of the trajectory of bilingualism, um, committing to having kids in the program um, for the whole duration, things like that. Um, so we can share that information. And let's say we'll go to the chat and see what folks are asking. How does the wait list for out of district K students work? Okay, so the um, wait list and all of the lottery has been postponed because our enrollment has been slower. Um, and you know we're waiting till we're in a good place to figure out whether the numbers can stay exactly as planned. Um, and where our enrollment is. I don't know, Dr. Morris, if you want to say anything else about that. Yeah, so I mean, I think um, just to be, uh, when I think out of district means different things to different people. So I want to make sure we're being clear and responding. So I'm assuming, but I could be wrong, um, that out of district in that question is referring to non Fort River district. Um, but there's two sort of out of districts. One is out of district, which is um, not in the Fort River catchment area or enrollment zone. And then there's a school choice program that we have um, for students who don't live in Amherst. And so those are two different things I wanna, but I think Katie described accurately um, the process for students who don't live in the Fort River area. Um, I think once we know what our model is for fall, we'll, we will be doing a lottery. Um, I suppose we could have pulled the lottery, but it just didn't feel quite right until we knew what the model was and knew uh, what our numbers are going to be. Um, so I think sometime in the next month, uh, I'm optimistic that we're able to do that. And, and then it works like a wait list um, in that uh, we offer it and sometimes families have expressed an interest and then you know we have families who change their mind. We had that last year and the first year and I imagine we'll have it again. Uh, but when we do the lottery, everyone knows where they are on the wait list so that if people are aware they're, they're first on the wait list could be that a family just moves away because of something uh, about parents' employment, whatever reason, um, then we'll go down that wait list. Um, there is a... Um, we try to maintain a 50-50 balance as best we can of uh, students with a Spanish language background and students who are more English dominant or have an English language background. And that's based on the research of what's the benefit for the program. That we want language, bo language models, uh, both in English and Spanish in the program. And so there, that also affects how the wait lists work and how the lottery works. But I wonder if um, maybe uh, on that slides, I can put the enrollment policy as a link um, so that people could access it directly instead of the slides they couldn't because of the way it was, but I, I'm right. happy to put that up there. Um, I, I will- It feels okay. helpful, I can just quickly say the, um, the sort of order of how the enrollment works. So there's um, Spanish speaker seats that are held, um, which is up to half of the program. And so that would be first to Spanish speakers in the Fort River zone and then to Spanish speakers that are in the Wildwood and, and uh, Cracker Farm zones. And then from there, we go to English speakers in the Fort River zone and then English speakers in the wider district. Um, so that's kind of the order of, of the lottery groups as we work through the registration process. And when we go to this one next, I see that I'm, I'm missing one about, but let me do this so that I can I'll give this to Katie and Diane and then I can find the link. Yeah, there's one related up, up above for sure, Mike. So. Yeah. So I'll jump in, Katie, and fill out the areas for me, too. So it tends to be the data shows us that students acquire language um, at a very rapid rate bilingually, and the neuroplasticity of the brain grows phenomenally when kids are being taught in two languages. So that said, um, students do tend to acquire the skill of reading in both languages at a little bit different pace than if you were just learning one language at a time. But data also tells us by about third grade, it all evens out. So at the end of kindergarten, your child might be reading at what we call a level D um, in English, um, where if they, if they were being taught in both languages, and perhaps your child is a really strong reader and may have been at level F. But because they're learning at two different languages, we look at those, those assessment scores together. And if they're making the year's progress um, by putting those scores together, 
then they're right on. And our kids have shown the data this year has been phenomenal, that the kids are really acquiring the language at the pace that we want them to. So um, math tends to come along right along because math is a little bit more of a universal language. Um, but the acquisition of reading skills um, will potentially be slower than if you were learning just a monolingual um, path. But like I said, that evens out. Um, and all the data testing, formalized testing says that actually long-term benefits are um, advancing if you're um, just advancing beyond a monolingual path. Hope I said that well. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, if not, please uh, put a chat in and we'll get, we'll get deeper into it. Um, and I think this is the one I missed earlier. I apologize. Um, so I'll just say, when will Fort River kids find out if they're in the program, if we choose it as a preference? I think we the only thing that is barring us from doing that actually right now is we don't actually know how many students, what our model is going to be. Um, so that's the only thing I think once we get clear in our model, that'll be the first step is figuring out how many students and how many Fort River students who express in preference. Uh, and then we'll do the lottery um, and go from there. But, you know, throughout, you know, Ms. Richardson and others and probably Ms. Torres will be communicating with all families so people are aware of, uh, of where the process is. And we apologize that it's not quite as smooth as, we, you know, we drew up this policy last year. We made some ad adaptations, work with the school committee on that based on feedback we heard from families and, and the school committee's feedback. And it was actually right to, about to be approved, if I remember, Katie, and then our meeting started getting canceled. So um, we did, you know, get this approved this spring in a virtual meeting, um, but, you know, we we're having to adapt given the situation. So we apologize and uh, for, for everyone, for the staff uh, in particular, they'd love to have the list up and running and be reaching out. And we had lots of plans for summer that uh, we're adjusting for, for incoming kindergarten uh, students and comandantes. So uh, the thing that I can commit to you is that we'll continue to communicate frequently so you know where we are in the process. Um, yeah, and on that point, I can say we're thinking about, um, we've been really lucky to have some grant funds to support um, building our bilingual programs. And so we're hoping to have some opportunities for incoming families, you know, nothing major um, because it's not age appropriate, but just, you know, some periodic meetings, some opportunities to start engaging in Spanish. Um, to meet the teachers, things like that over the summer. So at, once we know, um, you know, a little bit more, we will be reaching out with some opportunities to connect. Sure, we got a couple more comments in there. So thank you so much. This is uh, what we're hoping for, that who is uh, more uh, two way. So this is great. So will you enlarge class size in first grade if this year needs to be smaller for COVID, allow new entries for first grade? Um, I think until we know the model, it's really hard to answer those very reasonable and good questions. Um, and uh, that's sort of holding us up, uh, unfortunately, on this. Uh, I think, frankly, the CDC guidance is not going to allow for larger class room sizes. But I think, you know, I understand the question to be perhaps grade level or cohort sizes. And uh, as the models get developed, and, and again, we'll be presenting some of those options and, and letting you know when we're supposed to receive guidance from, from DESE uh, in coming weeks uh, tomorrow night. And that'll allow us to start making decisions along those dimensions. But um, right now we're, we're having a hard time making definitive statements on it because we don't wanna make them until we really know what exactly what the school models look like next year. Katie, Diane, anything you wanna add or? I think in general, it would be um, definitely a, a, a big shift in our plan to allow any new entries in first grade or at any grade level other than kindergarten, unless they're um, a newcomer or Spanish speaker um, coming into the district. We're really focusing on having students come in in kindergarten um, because everything's so uncertain. You know, we probably can't say that set in stone, but um, our understanding from other districts that have been doing this a long time is really to start the, everyone in kindergarten and to move that group through. Um, and going to the, there's a question about sibling preference. So the policy as approved is that siblings do get priority within their group. Um, so if you have a sibling, say in, um, let's say English speaker from Fort River, then you would be top of that list, right? Or if you're an English speaker zoned for Crocker Farm, you'd be top of that group. Does that make sense? So there's that's one question. Um, yeah, thank you for I, the rest. There are more comments. Um, and Maria Lucia is on here, so I'm just going to give her a shout out for um, 
in her other with her other hat that I think she's on the call with. But uh, we are really, and maybe it, it is worth saying, and, and Katie and Diane, you can jump in. We are incredibly fortunate that we have a partnership with UMass. Um, they support us both in terms of professional development. They give us professional guidance. They're connected. Uh, staff are connected to MABE, which is the multi-state association of bilingual education. We got it finally right. It used to be Massachusetts. Now it throws me off that they're multi-state, but they, they're, they're the big game in town in, in uh, New England. Um, so that we're consistently improving the program. We're really pleased with the first year, how, how it went, like Diane and Katie said, and we are dedicated to continuous improvement, what was said in the earlier conversation. And so we're, uh, we, you know, we had a program of, you know, we had folks come in and assess how we're doing and make recommendations for the future. And, uh, you know, so I think uh, we're really, really lucky that we're not on an island, which there aren't many of these programs in Massachusetts, particularly in the western part of Massachusetts, growing. So we have some nice partners now, in Holyoke and Springfield's uh, planning on building out a program. Uh, but having some professional expertise, uh, incredible professional expertise and guidance has been so reassuring uh, for a program that hasn't happened in our district before. So um, not in the same way it is now. So thank you, Mary Louisa, and with your other hat on. One of the other questions that kept coming up last year is who's going to teach the program? So I would just like to put a plug in that we're really proud that our founding teachers are returning. Um, we've got a great staff of really committed folks. And um, as we grow the program, we were actually able to secure the first grade teacher for next year knows the kindergarten cohort so it's kind of moving along with them our kindergarten teacher will stay but we had an intervention teacher that we hire that will be moving into first grade so again the kindergarten teachers already have a really strong relationship with one another are working very well with one another and have founded the program and are moving into the year two it's great so i saw there was a question that came up of i email just to me but just want to note that um someone has a question of whether their registration went through or not um Certainly, Jadira Torres would be the person to contact. Um, it's T. Uh, I can put her, or maybe Debbie can, if she's still on the live stream, put her email address in. So, if there's any questions about making sure it went through, I'm one of those people too. I always want like the return receipt and all that kind of stuff. So, I, I get it. Um, but she'd be the person just to send a quick line to and check in to make sure that uh, what got submitted went through. It, it's very unusual because kindergarten registration is usually this. Uh, having done it, it's sort of momentous parent event where you go in and even the registration, you're just filling out paperwork, but it feels metaphorically significant, more significant, uh, and doing it electronically is uh, not quite the same thing. So I'll put her email in the um, chat and certainly please be in touch with her. Um, and she's wonderful and wonderfully responsive um, if there's any questions about um, that. It should also put Mildred Martinez actually in as well. Um, I would email both of them. We're, we're, in our current uh, situation, both of them have been involved in that process, and, and actually, probably Mildred is the first. Um, right, Jadira is more for school choice, but um, let me just make sure I have Mildred's email right. Um, yes, I do. Um, and um, so I apologize. Um, but there you go. There's Mildred's email, and so if you do uh, want to check in about how that's um, with her, um, she's the registrar for the elementary schools. Jerry formerly had that job, and um, time's looking funny for all of us. So I forgot that, about that transition for a second. Uh, but I would just send an email to Mildred, and she'll have that information. Are there questions uh, for any of us? Well, I think. Uh, before I do some closing things, I'll give Katie and Diane an opportunity if there's anything else you'd like to share. Um, no, I mean, I think really we're just excited to talk with you more when we have more specifics we can share. Um, and, you know, I hope that soon, as, as Dr. Marr said, we're all really anxious to know what the models will be and be able to start planning. So certainly the question about um, how are we thinking about keeping the 50-50 model, we are, of course, but We've, you know, I have a zillion different uh, scenarios going through my head of what does that look like, right? And and we don't know where we're going to land yet, so we will be in touch. Um, but certainly, just reach out as you have questions. Um, we're happy to, you know, engage with with you at any point as you're thinking this through. The only other thing I want to say is, if your child's not in the, in the program, it doesn't mean they're not connected to multiculturalism, and they're they're definitely connected to the program just by being another kindergartner. But also because we've tried to infuse. Um, multi language multilingualism and multiculturalism throughout the building so it's not it's not a, a loss model it's a it's a gain model no matter where you are for sure 
<laughs> and I'll just tell a little anecdote uh, that I think is worth mentioning. So uh, earlier this fall, it was early, I want to say it was October, Diane will probably remember, uh, we had a visit from the Massachusetts School Building Authority. So we're in the pipeline for potentially a future either uh, renovation or, or uh, building project. And so these are mostly architects, engineers, and they're coming to look at the school from a technical site. And so, you know, they do like to look into classrooms. And in our application, we mentioned that we had a dual language class uh, program because it has implications for, um, frankly, how we might build it. And uh, and so uh, we had this group of, and I'm not trying to stereotype, but folks who uh, really care deeply about education, but they're not they're not educators. Um, uh, they really want to support children and teachers to have wonderful schools. And so the last thing they do is they take a tour and, and, you know, mostly we're going down into the boiler room and places that frankly, I'm no use and, and don't really know what's happening. And the last thing they do in their whole tour is they want to see classrooms and said, you know, where would you like to go? And they were, uh, you know, these folks who the whole time, very businesslike, very professional, uh, were just like, can we please go to see the dual language program? We've never seen one before. We want to see it. And so, of course, we took them there and they really wanted to see the Spanish in particular. Most of the people, actually all the people from MSB on the tour were um, no one identified as being Spanish speaking. And they were so blown away walking into a kindergarten room in the second month of a dual language room with the engagement um, and um, how much students were already starting to speak uh, and clearly understanding uh, uh, the language, but also understanding what they were doing and the uh, teacher's ability to communicate in a language that half the students had no exposure to um, prior to six weeks before, which is incredible. And so that image stays with me because I think it does feel a little bit like magic um, because if you put a bunch of us adults in that setting, we would have a hard time acquiring that second language in the same rate and pace that, that young students do. Uh, but they are wonderfully like sponges um, in terms of both the engagement uh, but also about uh, their learning. And it's it's been incredible to see over the course of the year the progress that our students have made. And so uh, certainly this is a, a parental decision. We, we hope people are interested in the program. I think there's last year we had a long wait list and we were not able to get to every nearly half of the wait list uh, of folks who wanted to participate. And I think if, if, if this year taught us anything, it's that we want to continue to expand the program and hence our commitment to even in this awkward time where we don't have everything clear, we're fully committed to the program uh, continuing and thriving in the future. So that's where we are with um, with um, Comandantes. If there are questions, perhaps Katie, um, you could put your email in the chat as well, because it comes up as a link on the YouTube that people can directly click. Um, she's, she's the coordinator of the program, certainly get in touch with me or Diane as well. Uh, but we really appreciate you being on the call. Um, and oh yeah katie has another good idea which i just noticed one of the things that we'll see if we can pull up uh i'm not sure we can get it up that quickly but we did a window into arps episode uh which is uh kind of like a monthly or a little more show similar to this just it's in person and amherst media our public access channel uh tapes it and uh we, i interviewed um staff member but also a parent uh, who spoke about the program and they could they did it much more justice than we did today they were wonderful mm -hmm. um, so we'll see um, if we can get that up um, we may end this call but I'll put it in the chat probably two minutes from now if I'm able to pull it up uh, unless there's anything Katie or Diane want to say to give me time to pull it <laughs> no I just thought it'd be a great way to to hear more I think hearing from parents um, is a great way for folks that are coming into the program to be thinking about it and, and learning more so oh I got it um all right, let's see if I can. And I encourage you not to let your monolingualism limit your uh, uh, potential in this program. I'm estoy aprendiendo. We are all trying to learn along the way, and uh, it's okay if you don't know Spanish, and your kids can learn it anyway. <laughs> and so that last link is the. Uh, it's about 25 minutes, but again, I think it, it it gets into a lot more detail than we did today, and shows you both the the staff and the teacher, um, the staff, the teacher role, but also the parent role, and and what they're experiencing as well. So again, please thank you for staying on for uh, an extended call on a sunny afternoon. We hope you go outside and enjoy your kids and um, enjoy this time of year and continue to engage with us, ask us questions, um, and we'll, we'll do the same the other way around. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.